Hey guys, welcome back to Weld.com. So today we're going to do a continuation of a video we did a while back called Gas Tungsten Arc Welding 101. So in that video, uh, we explained, you know, what type of equipment to use, different consumables for the torch, different things you want to consider when you're going to go ahead and make a weld, some bead on plate, uh, feeding the filler metal. Today we're going to take it one step further and we're going to do some lab joints. So we're going to do an autogenous joint, which is just a fancy word for fusion welding. And then we're going to do one with filler metal. Uh, we're going to use some eighth inch thick carbon steel plates. Uh, we're going to show you some little do's, don'ts, uh, different tricks, nuances, techniques, how to get comfortable and proficient with this process. So the first thing we want to talk about is PPE. So we obviously, because the UV rays that are present with gas tungsten arc welding or any arc welding process, we want to cover up any exposed skin. So arms, um, hands, all that stuff. Uh, if you're a short haired fellow like me, you're going to want a welding cap. If you're a bald haired fellow like the, uh, or bald headed fellow like the cameraman, you're definitely going to want a cap. Uh, just cover your grate. You know, you want some protection up here. You don't want to get a sunburn on top of your head. The next thing, gloves, right? We want to cover up our hands. I prefer um, leather gloves. I don't like to wear, uh, you know, like the form-fitting synthetic fiber gloves that you can find at your auto parts stores. Just for the simple fact that although this doesn't produce any sparks, we're still going to deal with hot metal. So if you bump into a hot piece or on the table, anything like that, those synthetic fibers can melt, and when they melt, they're going to go to they're going to melt to your skin. You just want to avoid that. So get some you know good, um, good fitting leather gloves. Uh, those are going to help out a lot. Next thing we want to talk about is the welding hood. Okay, there are many like it, but this one is mine. No. Um, so if you refer back to the AWS document Z49.1, there's a lens shade chart in there, and it's going to tell you what shade they recommend for the process you're going to be using and the ampers you're going to be working with. Uh, so today we're going to be using gas tungsten arc welding process. I'm going to be running about 130 amps. So between 50 to 150 amps, they recommend a 12. However, the minimum you can get away with is an 8. I prefer to run with a shade 9. That's just me. It's my personal preference. Uh, the best rule of thumb is to start off with their shade that they recommend, which would be the darkest setting, and work your way back down from that and just find out what's comfortable for you. So like I said, shade nine is, is pretty comfortable for me. In addition to that, we wanna cover up our eyeballs, right? There's only two of them. Uh, so we wanna keep those as protected as possible. So make sure you have um, approved safety glasses. These are Z87.1 rated uh, safety glasses. They fit the criteria. They're polycarbonate, so they also deflect UV rays. Make sure you got pants on, work boots. You know, you're gonna be in a shop. Don't be welding in uh, board shorts and a t-shirt. Uh, you can get away with weld sleeves, as long as you have a thick enough cotton t-shirt uh, behind there, I have gotten, you know, UV burns or like a sunburn from wearing a white shirt while I was welding with weld sleeves on. So I don't recommend that. You know, you live, you learn, um, you get over it. So let's go ahead and we're going to start off with, um, we'll cover some of the, uh, the consumables that are in here and then we'll get into the autogenous weld. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to build our torch. So I have a, a 332nd gas lens right here. These things are great. Uh, you can, I mean, you can get by with a standard collar body if that's what you have. Practice on those. Um, they're great, but you know, I mean, if you're going to start getting into more stuff, I prefer a gas lens, get better shielding. Uh, next thing, we have a 332 collet. Okay, this piece is going to go in here in the back end. And then what I prefer to do is go ahead and put my back cap on loosely at first, and then I will put on my cup. I have a number seven right now. You can get away, you can use the number six as well but I have a seven at my disposal. The next thing is my tungsten. I have a, a 332nd E3 tungsten that I'm gonna be using. I have a 30 degree grind on, angle on here, and I like to keep the grind angle a little bit lower for like thinner materials, small edges, for the simple fact that uh, I have a smaller arc width on there. You know, if I wanted a wider arc width, if I was doing some pipe or open root, um, you know, a wider bead, I would go ahead and crank that out to a 60 degree angle. And gas lenses are great because I can have a much longer stick out However, I prefer about the same diameter as my cup, so I have a number seven cup, so I can stick out to about seven sixteenths. I'll put that on there. Like I said, you can get away with a much, much more or much larger stick out. This is just what I prefer to work with, especially for this joint right here. All right, so one thing a lot of people don't consider, especially when you're starting out, um, the torches have like a natural lay in them, and you can you can fix that just by loosening up the uh, the nut that's in here, loosening that up, and just kind of rotating the torch and, and tightening it in place. You want it to sit relatively neutral. So if I'm holding it, you know, relaxed, that's roughly how I'm going to hold it in my hand. It's going to face straight up. Okay. If it's pointing this way, that means I have to grab it with my wrist and kind of fight that. And you're, you're going to develop fatigue, whether you realize it or not. I mean, you're not really holding much, but if you're doing this for long periods of time, 
you got to fight that torch to get it into, into that, that work angle that you want or that travel angle that you want. You don't want to have to fight it the whole time. So just kind of loosen your torch up, get it to where it's, you've got like a neutral lay in there to where it's standing straight up if you're holding it in your hand like this. Okay, it's just going to help you out. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to put four tacks on here. I'm going to put two tacks on this side. I'm going to flip it over to the back side, put two tacks on that. And the reason is because if I just start welding down this seam of the joint right here, it's going to start to pull these, these pieces apart, and then I've got a big gap to fill in on the other side that I'm going to be working with. I don't want that. So I'm going to put tacks on each side because what's heat do to metal? It's going to move it, right? As soon as I apply heat over here, it's going to start pulling. So two tacks on this side, two tacks on the back, and then we'll get into it. So the first weld we're going to do is called an autogenous weld. This is a very good weld for people that are just starting out to, uh, to practice and master this. It's also called a fusion weld. Uh, essentially what we're going to be doing is we're going to weld without filler metal. Just get used to manipulating that puddle. How is that puddle going to react? Right? I tell my students all the time, your puddle is like your MasterCard. Right? You don't want to leave home without it. So you want to get that puddle established before you start moving down the joint. What's really common is for people to get in here, they get the torch fired up, um, they've got heat going to it, and they just start adding filler metal to it and moving down the line, and it's not getting any penetration. It's not fusing into the sidewall of the, uh, the top plate. It's not fusing into the base of the bottom plate. Uh, you kind of end up with like some ugly looking caterpillar on top of there. You want to get that puddle established first, keep that filler metal in there, and then deposit that. We're going to go over that uh, right after we do this autogenous weld. We'll put this one in first just to cover the basics of travel angle, work angle, and watching that puddle, identifying that puddle, and learning how to manipulate it and work it through that joint. One thing I do recommend, um, get something soft that's uh, not going to catch on your table. So you can use a backhand for MIG welding, put that on your table to where you can go, kind of go down nice and easy and smooth where you're not going to catch anything. Another great thing is these uh, the TIG fingers. You can also use exhaust wrap from um, uh, your local auto parts store. You can use exhaust wrap. Uh, just get in there, anything uh, that, that's smooth, that's not going to catch on anything, right? That way I can go through here and keep my travel speed, work angle, everything consistent and just go down that joint and just, once you start to learn how to identify how that puddle maneuvers and operates and, and things you can do to manipulate it, you know, you won't need things like this. Uh, they're just nice to have. It's an added benefit. It's not really a requirement. So when you're TIG welding, keep all of your weight on your, on your rear end. Okay, what, what's that mean? I want to keep all the weight on my butt. My hands are just going to be resting on the table. What's very common for people to do is they, they lean into it, and then that's when you start developing friction, catching on things. You can't move as fluid subconsciously. You don't even realize it. You're putting pressure on your hands, okay? Try to keep all the weight on your rear. Put your hands on the table lightly. Just rest them up there and just glide across the surface that you're working on. So let's go ahead and get into it. I've got a flex head, so I'm going to bend this back a little bit. It's just my preference. I want to maintain a 45 degree angle to where I have equal heat on the bottom plate as well as on this top plate. So right up in that joint. Now because the material is an eighth inch, I don't want my puddle width to exceed an eighth of an inch. So I don't want to go any higher than the top edge of this plate. I want to keep the same leg length on the bottom of the plate. So I should be an eighth inch up and an eighth inch out. So th this weld should basically form you know, a triangle in there, a perfect triangle, a right angle triangle, equal leg lengths on both sides. All right, so with this, um, turned out pretty good. We, uh, we didn't melt away or erode that top layer too much. I got a couple little spots in there where we got a little bit of erosion here towards the end. But for the most part, that top edge is maintained. Good fusion into the joint. The weld's going to be concaved because you don't have any filler metal in there. So it's going to have that nice little washed in effect. Uh, it's really good, really effective for thin gauge sheet metal where you don't have to put filler metal in there. Uh, we're going to go ahead and flip it over and we'll do a joint with filler metal and show you guys exactly how to do that. All right, so let's talk filler metal for a second here. I have an eighth inch piece right here. This is not what I'm going to use to weld on this uh, material. But if you're just starting out uh, TIG welding, you got your machine all picked out and everything, you got your consumables, all that you need, you need to start practicing on how to run your filler metal. What I recommend is just grab an eighth inch piece. Doesn't have to be steel. You can use aluminum, stainless, doesn't matter. Go ahead and bend you a little hook on both ends here. We're not going to be welding with this. I'm just going to show you a little trick. So I teach all my students to run their filler metal, learn how to run their filler metal. So when you're sitting at home watching your Netflix or Game of Thrones, whatever, you know, go ahead and grab your, your piece of filler metal with the hooks bent on both ends so you don't stab anybody's eye out and just practice feeding the filler metal, okay? Whatever technique you decide to use, 
This is uh, predominantly, for the most part, this is the technique that I use right here. I just grasp it with my two, two fingers up here, index and middle, feed it with that, and once you get all the way to one end, run it the opposite way. Okay, just get used to manipulating your hand. It's gonna be strange for some of you in the beginning, and it's gonna take a while to get used to. You could do the cane kid with these two fingers. You know, you're gonna find out what works for you, what's, uh, what's easy for you to manipulate. Whatever it is, you wanna be comfortable when you're doing it. Okay, you can use the little, this method here. Whatever's gonna keep the tip of your wire the most stable, whatever's gonna be the most comfortable for you, use whichever method you prefer, practice all of them. Uh, once you get good with your non-dominant hand, go ahead and switch to your dominant hand because sometimes you're gonna have to weld left-handed. It's just gonna happen. Or if you're a left-handed individual, you're gonna have to learn to weld right-handed. So you have to, you're gonna have to learn how to do it with both hands. So get you a piece and just practice while you're watching TV. Uh, and you know, it's just gonna help you when you get into actual welding, being able to feed and keep the, the filler metal controlled. The next thing, when I do steel and stainless, uh, I like to cut my filler wire in half. Okay, so I get it to about the 18 inch point. Uh, I always bend a hook on the end just for safety and then it kind of gives me an indication if I, if I catch up right here, on my glove gives me an indication I'm running out of my filler metal when I feel the end of that hook coming. But um, you can see that if I hold this, you know, just a little bit of movement down here causes a lot of movement up here. So if this thing starts swinging around, it's gonna move this tip quite a bit. So if I can shorten that duration up, um, it's just gonna keep the end of this rod a lot more stable. Now, I don't do this with aluminum just because I'm feeding the rod so fast um, that, you know, it's, it's, it's just easier to run a 36 inch filler metal than it is with 18, but for steel, stainless, any of those, um, I go ahead, I cut them down. Because I'm welding eighth inch material, I want an eighth inch weld when I get done with this. So just food for thought, usually one and a half times the diameter of the filler metal. All right, so we'll go ahead, get into this, same technique, put my little uh, TIG finger up here, get in position, 45 degree travel angle, right? So right into the joint, equal heat on both parts, and I'm gonna have about a 10 degree push angle. Now that we're adding filler metal in here, angle of my filler metal is just important as the angle of my torch. I wanna make sure that these maintain a 90 degree angle or perpendicular to one another. So if I start to rotate this way, which I shouldn't on this joint, um, I'm gonna rotate that filler metal as well. So wherever that is, I wanna maintain that, that 90 degree angle. So if I have a 10 degree angle here, I'm gonna bring this up to about 10 degrees to where they're perpendicular to one another. I wanna keep the tip of my filler wire right up underneath the, the column of this shielding gas, right up underneath the nozzle because it's gonna do two things for me. It's going to keep the end of my, shield, or my filler metal shielded from oxide, so I'm not depositing oxides into my weld metal. And it's also going to preheat the tip of the, electro, or the, uh, the filler metal. That way when I touch the, the leading edge of that puddle, it's gonna melt off very uniformly, very nice. If I get my travel angle too far apart, right? if I exceed that, I go to an obtuse angle or greater than 90, when I try to deposit that filler metal, it's gonna melt off. Okay, it's gonna melt off before I can get it into the puddle. I don't want that. Likewise, if I get into a, an acute angle and I'm, and I'm feeding it in like this, you know, less than 90, what that's gonna do is that, that filler metal is going to stick to my puddle, right? You ever get that, that feeling that, you know, something's pulling on the end of your filler metal when you're trying to pull away? It's because your angle's uh, not correct. So go ahead and open that angle up a little bit. Try to maintain that 90 degrees. We'll go ahead and we'll just weld right down this joint. Remember, I'm shooting for an eighth inch weld, which would be right up to the, uh, the top edge of this plate here. Okay, they've joined together. So now I'm gonna start adding that filler metal. Just watching that weld size, making sure I don't go up over that top edge there. Okay, one other thing you want to do before you get into this, I always recommend to do a dry run. So just take your torch, get in your, uh, your work angle, your travel angle that you're going to be utilizing, and just kind of just, just move through the joint. Make sure you have enough range of motion to get all the way through without having to do a start and stop. Okay, Other materials, yeah, you're going to have to do a start and stop, but always plan those out. Don't be surprised by your hose catching up on something or your hand getting you know caught up on a tack on the table. Anything that's going to prohibit you from getting from A to be in a nice smooth uniform fashion right so always do always do a dry run you know whatever the process is going to be make sure you got enough range of motion to get from where you plan to start where you plan to stop
Once we get to the end, we're going to fill that crater in, taper off slowly, and then hold right there at the pause, let that post flow do its job. So we got even bead profile, uh, even leg length on both sides, the vertical and the horizontal part of the leg. Good penetration because I watched that as it went in. Nice uniform bead. Focus on the principles. Focus on the basics uh, of your technique. Learn your technique inside and out. Practice, practice, practice. You know, I close out every video with saying, make every weld better than your last. What you should be doing as you go through is analyze your, your weld. Analyze every weld and say, okay, what went wrong with that pass? What could I fix? And then say, what went right with that pass? You know, I, I nailed the travel angle, but you know, my, my travel speed was a little off. So make those adjustments. I always say, you know, make two to three passes before you make any adjustments. That way you can kind of really pin down exactly uh, you know, what you need to improve on or what you need to change or manipulate you know, to be any different. If you got any questions, comments, concerns, go ahead and drop them down in the comments section. I'll be happy to jump in there and join you guys and answer any questions you may have. And until next time, make every well better than your last.